in the next session. So now I would like to invite the second speaker. Um, he's uh, uh, Jan McLean, and a uh, few words about uh, his uh, CV. Um, Jan McLean is graduated in Oxford, uh, where he also did his PhD. Um, he was for 24 years uh, a fellow and pre-lecturer of French at Queen's College and lecturer of, and reader of, uh, in modern languages at the University of Oxford. Then he became a titular professor in Renaissance studies at the University of Oxford before moving to All Soul College as a senior research fellow in history in 1996. He was also elected a fellow of the Royal Acad um, Historical Society and uh, the British Academy. Um, he, was, uh, he held visiting positions in Australia, USA, Canada, France, the Netherlands and Germany. Fellow librarian from 1998 to 2015 is now Emeritus Fellow at the University of Oxford and also College. Chevalier de la, de, dans l'ordre des arts et des lettres um, and member of the Academia Europea, he has published ex extensively on intellectual life in early modern Europe, including studies on Montaigne, Cardano and the higher faculties of law and medicine. Among his most recent, recent publications are Learning and the Marketplace, Essay of History of the Early Modern Book, and Scholarship, Com Commerce, Religion, the Learned Book of the Age of Confession, 1560-1630. Uh, uh, please, Jan, uh, can you, uh, do you, do you need the PowerPoint? Uh, good morning, everyone, and um, first of all, I'd like to thank Angela Nuovo for inviting me to this launch of her project, um, and uh, <clears throat> the document I, uh, I'm choosing to speak about actually falls right at the end of her period. It's in 1601, but it is directly relevant to books and prices, um, and um, uh, I'm going to move now from the macrosphere you've just heard about to the microsphere um, and talk about um, how you interpret very difficult documents in the Renaissance. And I'm going to look at one document in particular. And <coughs> this is um, uh, a catalogue produced by um, uh, a bookseller called Gaspare Bindoni of Bologna and Venice who lived between 1558 and 1618, um, who himself came from a publishing dynasty and married into a publishing dynasty in Bologna. In fact, he didn't have much money and he relied on his wife's family's money. Um, he also acted as the book agent from 1588 onwards of the greatest collector of books in Bologna, the naturalist, Ulisse Aldrovandi, and I'll come back to that relationship later. He moved between Bologna and Venice. He had a bookshop in Venice as well as in Bologna. Um, and I'm interested particularly in his relationship with the Frankfurt Book Fair, which is the largest book fair in Europe at this time. Um, he's first recorded as being present in the Frankfurt Book Fair in 1601, when he makes an aggressive attempt to break into a cartel of three Venetian booksellers who themselves had more or less cornered the trade in books between, both export and import, between Italy and Germany. And I'll mention them later. They are um, Francesco De Franceschi, uh, Giovanni Battista Ciotti, and Roberto Maietti. 
Um, after the Autumn Fair of 1601, which is the one which I'm going to talk about, the catalogue which he produces, um, he returned to Bologna via Pisa. And he was able to take the news to the very famous medical professor, Girolamo Mercuriali, that he had seen a book of his, an unauthorized set of lecture notes of Mercuriali being sold in Frankfurt, on the title page of which it announced that Mercuriali was dead, um, which was not very happy news for Mercuriali. And uh, Mercuriali himself then commissioned Bindoni to put this situation right, and the following year, Bindoni himself helps finance an authorized publication of a different work by Mercuriali. Also in 1602, the following year, he passes through um, Paris and uh, authorizes the publication of a work in Paris, which he pays for, undoubtedly with his wife's money, and, um, and then went on to Prague. And he continues to be active in Prague for quite a long time afterwards. At some point in 1603, probably at the Spring Fair, he was imprisoned in Frankfurt for debt, and we'll see exactly why that came about. And his debt was settled by a fellow Bologna merchant, not a book merchant, but someone uh, uh, dealing in other uh, goods, um, which he had to repay out of his wife's inheritance, which bankrupted him. And so after 1603, he becomes an itinerant throughout Europe. He acts as a book agent for people, but he stops himself having an active part in the market. And the last transaction, which we'll see on one of my slides, with the Frankfurt Fair was in the autumn of 1603 um, with um, the Plantin Moratus firm, which is something we will hear about later today as well. Um, <clears throat> so here is a man who is a classic case of an undercapitalized, risk-taking entrepreneur, about whom we've already heard, <laughs> who tried very hard to appear in a higher league of economic status than he actually belonged to. Now, I can't show a portrait of him, but I can show you his handwriting. Now, that's not bad, actually, you would say, but as I will show you, what actually comes out of the catalogue is the fact that he produced a catalogue with very, very poor um, handwriting. So we go on to the next one, and this is the actual catalogue, which is kept in a small uh, um, library in Bologna, who very kindly gave me access to it. It's the only surviving copy, um, and I can tell you about its provenance if there's any interest in that. As you see, I don't need to read out the title because it's very legible. It's, it relates to the Autumn Fair of 1601, and <coughs> it's all given prices. All of the books he describes are given prices in uh, German money. That's Florins and Soldi uh, in German money. Now, in this uh, catalogue of 590 entries... There are very short, as you can see from here, titles, format, price, and also the word novus appears quite, or novo, appears quite often, which can mean one of a number of things. And what I'm going to do is to point out some of the difficulties in interpreting these, um, these documents. I'm afraid it is rather precise. So novo, or novus, can mean either new to the Frankfurt Book Fair, or newly available in Frankfurt, but not in the fair itself, new to Bindoni's stall in, in, in Frankfurt, a first printing or a new edition. Um, now, um, it is not the case that all of the books marked in Bindin Bindoni's catalogue are in fact um, novo in the sense of new to the fair. In fact, only 44 out of 285 marked novo are. And the other two catalogues I shall mention at the end, by Maietti and Giotti, have the same problem. So I want to now just to say a few words, because I don't think everyone is acquainted with how the Frankfurt Book Fair worked, about the actual operation of this fair in regards to books only. In 1597, after a long period of sort of anarchy, the Frankfurt Lutheran Council issued an official catalogue of books and advertised, 
and appointed a, a senior figure to oversee its production. But there are other versions of, this, of the books available printed, notably one by Georg Villa of Augsburg. And what Villa was, he was a Catholic uh, bookseller, and in his activity, one of his most important activities, because Augsburg falls on the road between Frankfurt and Italy, was to actually communicate the contents of the Frankfurt Book Fair to Italian booksellers and Italian scholars. And so there is, in fact, a Catholic version of the Book Fair catalogue as well as a Lutheran one. Now, the Council also regulated the exchange rate between foreign currencies. So every, every, the beginning of every fair, a set of exchange rates was stated, and they changed very considerably in two or three years. So uh, the problem to which Professor Zanini has already referred to is a very serious one. Um, and the exchange between publishers occurred not only with money, in fact, rarely with money, but mainly um, in what is known locally as Tauschhandel, exchanging printed sheet for printed sheet according to a formula that the uh, Frankfurt Book Fair um, uh, uh, describes uh, exactly. So you, you have to follow what they call a Frankfurter tax. It's not a tax, it's a, a price system. And this, um, I think, is known in Italy as Baratto or Arisma. The title also of the Frankfurt Book Fair, which you can see here, specifies another thing. It specifies the sorts of conditions under which any book can be advertised. And they are, if you look at the Latin, vel novi, vel emendatiores, aut auctiores. So the book had to be new or uh, corrected or in, uh, in, enlarged in some way. Um, and these are the conditions which are very akin to what we would call the history of copyright or the history of licenses and privileges. Um, now, naturally enough, Frankfurt, as well as being the place which apparently uh, only allows these sorts of conditions to apply, was the one place where any person who wanted to make an unauthorized copy of something could do so because the books were all available. And that's what occurs very frequently. It's, um, uh, the Frankfurt area itself is governed by the Holy Roman, Holy Roman Empire, not by anyone else. And so if you have a privilege from France or a privilege from the Pope or whatever, it doesn't apply. The, the Pope claimed to have authority over Frankfurt, but that's only a claim. Um, and one particular set of these reprintings, Ill illicit or unauthorized reprintings, is described as with phrases like nunc primum in Germania excusus for the first time printed in Germany. Um, and there are a group of entrepreneurial German printers and publishers who set out to profit from the fact that they lie outside jurisdictions which otherwise would restrict their activities. And they produce less expensive copy, usually in smaller formats, and not just for a local market. And one of the remarkable things about Bindoni's catalog is that he re-imports into Italy books that were initially published in Rome, Florence, and Venice, usually in quarto, in octavo on cheaper paper from Germany. So actually he is undermining uh, in a very unpatriotic way what's going on in Italy. Now I want to just quickly go through a couple of other problems. The f the, so that's the example of the book fair catalogue. Um, I want to look at uh, the meanings of apud. Apud is what appears at the bottom uh, in the imprint of lots and lots of books. And it doesn't mean what people very often assume it means, or it means rather a lot of other things. So it can mean printed or published by, and I, if I, go, I don't know how legible this is, but in the case on this particular sheet, which is the Libri um, Peregrinati at the top end, I think. Um, the um, book by Leone is in fact printed and published by Ciotti and it just appears as Apud, and that's, that's fine. It also means marketed by, as in the case of Zucchi in this list, and uh, Nazari. It also could mean sold through, that's just simply 
you'll find the book at this particular bookstall, and that's the case of the Diporto de Vianandi. And finally, it can mean um, actually uh, none of those things, but just have a, a sort of general link to the person in question. And so it's really quite important to be sure of what the word apud means when you come to an analyze a catalog. Um, interestingly, also in these Libri Peregrini, these books from abroad in foreign languages, um, one can note how uh, very often the transcription is very inaccurate. But the one thing that in almost every case is accurate is the format. So quarto, folio, or whatever, because in fact the application of the exchange of books through Tauschhandel or Barata or whatever is actually dependent on the definition of format. Now, the Venetians at the Frankfurt Book Fair from the period about 1597 sell through a consortium which they call the Societas Veneta. And that, that is De Franceschi, Ciotti and Maietti. Only two titles in 1599 come out with this consortium name, and none at all in 1600 or 1601, eight in 1602, and then 136 in 1603, and 107 in 1604. So something happens very seriously in 1603 to change the people's these very, very successful entrepreneurial importer-exporters of books to change their view about the usefulness of a consortium. And I'll come back to that point. Most of the books sellers who appear at the uh, Frankfurt Book Fair uh, rely not only on the catalogue, but also on backlists or publishers' lists and these are known as nomenclaturae. Here is an example, as it happens, of one from uh, the uh, uh, Officina. In this particular case, it means a bookshop of uh, uh, Johannes Baseus. Um, uh, but they almost certainly should have existed for all of the Italians. And what's available here is a complete list of all of the available uh, books. Um, and these books would have been kept in Frankfurt, in warehouses, uh, a fact which is not noted. Now, this is the very famous picture of the Buchgasse, the book alley in Frankfurt, which is, uh, if I can do this, I'll try. Is that, is that the pointer? That is the Buchgasse. And as, it's, as you see, it's marked there. It goes up like that. It's not very big space. It's only about 70 yards long. But here is the Carmeliten Kloster, the convent of the Carmelites, and that was the place where books were stored by people coming from outside. So it's very, very close. So you'd have had a, a, this announcement of the books, and people then would have to walk 50 yards to go and get copies that were not actually on sale in the fair. Um, all of the above, I've mentioned, were public documents, and they record, but there are also private documents, and that's what I want to come on to now. These are the transactions made between publishers and booksellers at the fair. Uh, and when one thinks that in 1574, Henri Etienne, who describes the fair as the Athens of the North, where scholars come together with publishers and there's this marvelous intellectual atmosphere. By 1600, very, very few scholars go to the fair. Nearly all the activity occurs between publishers or booksellers. Um, there's also a, a problem about the fair, which I'll very briefly mention. But this is a very complex area, which is to do with the six monthly account. So people will buy something and have to pay six months later except that the Italians seem to avoid this system. What they try and do is to settle bills on the spot. So they actually either by exchange, and we'll see some examples of that in a minute, or by, um, uh, by money, would actually settle the bill. Um, now, the reason for that, I believe, is that they didn't go to all the fairs. They didn't go every six months. They probably went once a year. And by going once a year, they couldn't actually then rely on the six-month settlement. Um, now, we have a, a complete set of transactions of one particular firm 
that the very important Antwerp firm of Plantin Moretus in the whole of this period. Um, and what's particularly, this is one which I transcribed and commented on in Bibliophilia of 2011, which is uh, one, so that it's been entirely transcribed and all of the prices and everything been explained. What I want to come on to are the ones concerning Bindoni, who dealt with the Plantin Moretus uh, firm between 1601 and 1603. Um, and these were kept, the, the records were kept by a man called Peter van Tonghoen, uh, who was the agent of the Moretus firm in Frankfurt, uh, in rough notebooks called Cahiers, which he then copied up and made fair copies. Um, and so we're looking at the rough notebooks that we're going to see. So we begin the Bindoni sequence in 1601, and this occurs on page 62 of the Cahiers, and page 62 of the, sorry, am I doing something wrong? Thank you. Page 62 of the Cahiers um, shows that he was the last or pretty well the last uh, bookseller to be dealt with by Plantin Moretus. The first person that Plantin Moretus dealt with was Georg Villa of Augsburg, who was the major importer of books, in, uh, or the passage through which books were imported into Italy. Now, the books he acquired in this list, and I, and obviously I'm not going to go through the list, um, it actually um, do not appear in the, all of them in the 1601 catalogue, but quite a lot of them do. So I'll pass on to the next image, which is the autumn one. And here you note an interesting difference. There is not uh, massive things on both sides. These two are meant to balance these two issues. So in one case, you can see a, a computation at the bottom, which tries to make them equal in value. In this case, in the autumn, there is nothing on one side at all. So Bindoni must actually have bought these for money. Um, or alternatively, delayed the passage of uh, the money by six months, one thing or the other. Um, now, what we might go on to now is the spring of 1602, which is just after his catalogue. I'm going to come back to the comment written there, but we can, I can just show one thing very clearly, I hope. That's the autumn of 02. In the uh, autumn of 01, rather, if you go back one, you can prove that the prices he's quoting in his catalogue, Bindoni's catalogue, are the prices he actually traded in Frankfurt. And here is an example, a short passage from the Plantin Moretus Cahier relating to Bindoni in autumn 1601 with prices. And there below is my transcription of the catalogue the items. And you can see uh, the plus two and so on at the beginning up there, there's the number of copies bought. You can see they're exactly the same price. Um, and this, I think, proves to me that Bindoni was not actually circulating his catalogue to retail customers. In fact, almost certainly not. Um, what he was doing was attempting to establish in Italy what he saw operating very successfully in Frankfurt, which was a trade between booksellers who ha have an agreed price for themselves so that you can take a large range of goods abroad and, and then use them to barter, to, to exchange. Um, and so, in fact, the, the source of the Bindoni catalogue is almost certainly um, a, a Bolognese um, bookshop of about 1600. Um, and... Um, he obviously went well beyond Bologna. He has exchanges with um, uh, booksellers in uh, not only Venice and all these surrounding towns of Venice, but also with, in Naples and Rome. Um, now, one nice thing is that there is, in fact, um, Ulisse Aldrovandi's prices he paid for the books out of Bindoni's catalogue. The only problem is one which uh, already Professor uh, Zani has referred to, is the fact that I don't know what was his money of account. So in the case of Aldrin, it could be, it could be Bologna uh, lire, or it could be Venetian money, but it's certainly not German money. Now, as I showed you at the beginning, Bindoni's handwriting seems very good. 
But in the heat of the moment, during the exchange, it must have deteriorated. So rather like Van Tongeren's uh, uh, catalogue, it was full of crossings out and problems of one kind or another. Um, and so what, the only reason I've been able to identify pretty well all of this catalogue is because it is the cahier. So what Bindoni did is he started by going to one person, almost certainly Georg Villa, and did work, exchanges or bought for money a group of books from him. And then he wrote them down. And then he went to the next person he dealt with, and so on and so on and so on. Um, <coughs> and when he got home to Bologna, he gave what he had to a compositor who had a struggle with working out what a lot of these things want, uh, were meant uh, or, or said. So the first entry is a book by the very famous astronomer uh, Tycho Brahe, which is a copy of his letters, Epistolarum Opus, which comes out as Opus Actionum. So the compositor didn't know what he was meant to be writing. I'll just show you how difficult the interpretation is by taking this short sequence. So remember, you're probably a, a Neapolitan bookseller. You're trying to understand a catalogue that's been sent to you by someone who's trying to say, you know, I will exchange books at these rates. And what you read is, uh, for example, cons, col, one, two, fol, novo. That's all you get. Uh, or later on, cons, fils, fol, one, two, novo. Now, the only reason I'm able to identify these is because they all come from one particular exchange with a Magdeburg uh, bookseller. So the first one, col, is col. The second one is C-H-O-P-E-N is Köppen. The third one is Pfeil. And the last one is a bit easier. Um, I don't think there's any doubt about these interpretations, I might say. That I think they're correct. But it gives you some idea of what use it was to his colleagues elsewhere in Italy. I mean, what would enough they would have made sense of that? I mean, Pfeil, for example, was a very obscure jurist. Now... Um, I think, therefore, you, you can interpret this extraordinary document from Binoni uh, entirely from this internal process of working out who he's exchanging with. And they include not only Catholics, but also Reformed and Lutheran um, uh, enterprises. I, I make that point because there's a great difficulty about import, importing from certain addresses. So the two largest um, sources of scholarly um, works, which are without usually in Greek or Greek and Latin, which don't have any commentary with them, are the uh, Leiden firm of Raphaelengius and the Heidelberg firm of uh, Comelinus. Heidelberg and uh, uh, Leiden were two areas where the Inquisition banned all books on the grounds of their sources. So Comelinus and Leiden, uh, sorry, and Raphaelengius published their books without uh, saying where they came from. Um, and so one finds a lot of practices of this kind I could refer to elsewhere. So he does deal with these scholarly outputs, and it's quite clear that you know, one of the random facts about his um, catalogue and also those of Maietti and Ciotti is that Italy by this time was not producing enough school books or university books of a plain kind text using Greek. So all the Greek tends to come in from somewhere else. Um, he had a great deal to do with a firm called Belair from the southern Netherlands. And then I could quote a whole heap of um, other um, firms he dealt with. Perhaps most interestingly is a man who had just set, him, set himself up as a publisher in Frankfurt, a man called Johann Theobald Schönwetter, who himself, like Bindoni, was undercapitalized and taking enormous risks, and was himself to find himself in debtor's prison between 1604 and 1606 for having overextended himself. So there's, as well as there being very well-established people like Georg Villa and various other firms in, in Frankfurt, there are a lot of people trying to muscle in, to break into a market and not succeeding. Um, so as I have said, um, he largely quotes 
the official Frankfurter tax price for things, but he does find, Bindoni, when he's there, that there is one firm that's got far too much back stock, and he manages to uh, um, negotiate very low prices for this. This was the firm which began with Johann Weckel in the 1580s and ends up uh, with a man called Rodius or Rosa. Um, so as I said, the intended recipient of this catalogue must be someone who is, like him, exchanging at this level. As I said, the reference to the Autumn Fair of Frankfurt 1601 is very misleading. There are, uh, two, as I said, 285 uh, entries marked as Novo, of which only 44 appear in that catalogue. If one goes back another year, one finds a further 67. Strange enough, one finds some books which actually uh, uh, are announced a year or, or a, a fair after, already announced in 1601. And this refers to a very common practice among publishers, which people very often mistake, that when publishers first produce an edition, they produce a title page with different dates on it. So the date 1600, 1601, 1602 are presented at the same time, and that allows you to re-declare them at the fair one after another and get, as it were, three advertisements for the price of one. And there are other ways. There's a section in the uh, book fair catalogue called the Libri Proditori, which also allows you to double de declare. So I think probably, um, I hope I've made that clear enough. Um, I don't know what I'm going on to now. Oh, yes. I can now show you, I think, something of the uh, reaction of the, Frankfurt, of the Venetian cartel of not Franceschi, who was dead by that time, but his sons, uh, Maietti and Ciotti, to what um, was done by Bindoni. Bindoni threw down a, a challenge by producing this catalogue, so they, that's to say certainly Ciotti <coughs> and Maietti, produced rival catalogues for the next year, in the spring of 1602. Now, these are three very interesting figures. Um, um, De Franceschi was one of the earliest Venetians to go to the fair and actually attended the fair from the 1560s onwards, so, and he was an old man in 1599 when he died, um, and his sons carried on. And he was a person who specialised in post-Tridentine theological and religious books, very little in Italian vernacular writing, but he had a special interest in architecture and medicine. And um, all of these things contribute to the way in which Italy is represented in the northern part of Europe. Um, he had one brush with the Holy Office in 1599 for importing uh, a Protestant history of the, uh, of the world um, uh, and a, a, a book of Ephemerides, um, but he got off very lightly. And he and Maietti and Ciotti had very, very powerful protectors inside the Italian uh, uh, Catholic hierarchy. Um, Ciotti himself uh, was a prodigiously uh, productive Venetian publisher. He came there without very much money in 1587 or 85, perhaps that, somewhere around that period, and uh, ends up by producing an absolutely massive number of editions. He does take Italian vernacular literature very seriously, but he, like um, Fran De Franceschi and Maiotti, have an awful lot to do with the Jesuit order. They publish a lot of Jesuit material and a lot of liturgical and devotional material for the Catholic Church. He also is a publisher of Bellamino. And Maietti um, uh, is a more academic figure. Um, he starts publishing learned medicine in the 15, late 1560s. He has an interest in law and philosophy books. Um, he, he even publishes uh, audacious Italian philosophers like Francesco Patrizzi, but again has little interest in Italian vernacular literature. Um, now there's a lot more I can say about these figures I don't want to say now. Um, and um, what I would merely say is that they did produce these retaliatory catalogues. Here is um, Maietti's catalogue, who didn't pre proofread it terribly well, um, because Apud Robertum Maietum Pro Strant sounds a bit like a medical condition, 
and um, not sailing. And here is Chiotti's one. Uh, Maetti's catalogue is 754 titles long. Chiotti is 1290. Um, so what they did, as I hope to show, mention before, was they had this Societas Veneta, which they used as a sort of way of uh, acting as a consortium. And in 1603, they reproduced it in a massive form. They, so they weren't very bothered about using the word in 1601 or 1600. But they, as a, a reaction to Bindoni, the new um, boy on the block who's trying to break into their cartel, they start operating as a triad. Um, and furthermore, they do an even more aggressive thing. They move into Bologna, where Ciotti has a privileged status. Uh, not, uh, sorry, Bindoni has a privileged status, and they start actually importing Bologna books into Italy. Now, you could obviously say a great deal about the way in which uh, Bindoni's catalogue is, is biased towards one thing, and Ciotti and Maietti towards another. Um, and what I just briefly say is that uh, whereas the other two both uh, have ca a very large amount of theological material in it, Bindoni does not. But Bindoni, Bindoni was overweight in law, medicine, and humanism. And that strongly suggests to me that he was actually targeting uh, a Bolognese university market. Right, so I'll just say one or two words in conclusion. <clears throat> I hope I've shown that, that interpreting these documents is something, I don't think, uh, yeah. there's, there's the Bindoni invent inventory of 1600, which one could also talk about, um, which has a section, and I don't think I'm going to talk about that. Um, so first of all, I think we have to be very careful in reading these documents, and in especially f book fair catalogues, where you see uh, work, bad transcriptions, the word apud used in lots of ways, officina used in lots of ways, novo used in lots of ways. But secondly, I'd just like to point to just how difficult Bindoni was as a trading partner. And this is uh, uh, an excerpt from the Planta Moretus Calle of the spring of 1602. Um, as you can see, it's not very easy to read these documents Furthermore, they are not in one language. Uh, Tonghorn uses three languages. He uses Dutch, French, and uh, Latin, depending on who he's writing about. And this says, as you can see, I, I'll translate it if you would like me to, against all notions of fairness, that's contra omne jus et aequum, Bindone charged me 30 florins for the De Vitis Pontificum of uh, Platina, after the going rate had been imposed, so that they discussed the Frankfurter tax first, was what they did, they actually worked out what they would do the exchange by, and then he suddenly put a, a higher price on it. Others were charging 15 florins and no more. And Binoni couldn't see any reason why he shouldn't be paid a higher price. In other words, he was a pretty difficult uh, person to deal with. Now, there's a very nice text that was communicated to me by Dr. De Tata of Bologna, which describes Bindoni as impudent and arrogant. It was written by a man called Giovanni Antonio Maggini, and very recently, Angelo Nuovo has, interpreted, has, has sent me another text where he's described as a putana. So uh, he's not actually a very popular figure <laughs> when it comes to being described. Um, that was his behavior at the court of uh, uh, Rudolf II. He did go to Prague quite often. So here we have a man not only undercapitalized and uh, taking risks, but also someone with rather dubious moral characteristics. Thank you very much. <clears throat>